All right, so thanks for coming, everyone. Um, uh, today, I'm going to do a talk uh, about how to make a Discord dice rolling bot. It's going to be mostly a how-to and a little bit about the dice rolling bot I made and, and the choices I made along the way. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an intro, and I'll do a quick demo. Then I'll sort of, after you see what it is and, and what it does, I'll do a bit of an overview of the, all the components, and then we'll start diving a little deeper into the three main parts of it. The one we'll spend the most time talking about is Antler, um, because as you'll see, this um, dice bot uh, has to do parsing of some pretty you know, complex expressions. So a bit about me. Um, so I've been a software developer for a while, but um, much longer than that, I've been a tabletop role player. Um, so if you don't know what tabletop role-playing games are, um, you know, Dungeons and Dragons is probably the most popular and, and well-known one. Um, but there are a lot of different types of tabletop role-playing games. And they all have various different rules. But um, while this isn't universally true, it's typically the case that they will usually involve people sitting together around a tabletop. And they'll be going through some kind of adventure where they'll have uh, conflicts that they need to resolve, often by rolling dice. So, you know, in 2020, uh, my group had to switch to playing online. And, you know, there are web apps out there for playing tabletop role-playing games, but we decided that it would be easier for us to start with something simple. Uh, so we wanted to try just using um, uh, Discord for video calls and using bots to roll dice. And we actually started off using um, other dice rolling bots that existed at the time. Um, we used a great one called Dice Maiden. And actually, a lot of the features in the bot that I made that I'll show you are, are taken directly from Dice Maiden. Um, but it was missing one really important feature that I wanted, which is why I started this project. So um, I'm going to jump into a demo now of this bot. Uh, it's called Modus Rollins. And let me find Discord and make sure my bot is still running. It is. So can I get a quick show of hands? Who here like, has used Discord or has a vague idea what it is? OK, great. So I don't have to say anything about that. Um, so um, has a, who, can I get a show of hands of people who've interacted with a Discord bot before? OK. So Discord bots work like bots in pretty much any other instant messaging platform you've used. Um, they join Discord servers, they can monitor text channels, and they can respond and do a bunch of other things. Um, the bot I made, so it primarily it's uh, for rolling dice. So if I list help, you'll see there are a lot of different kinds of dice rolling expressions that it supports. And actually, can people see this, or do I need to make it a little larger? How's that? Better? OK. So if I um, do something like for a Dungeons and Dragons game, I might roll a 20-sided die, and I might add some modifier to it. That's um, sort of a really simple expression. But there are a lot of other kinds of tabletop role-playing games with more complex rules. So for example, there are games where I might roll multiple dice, and I might decide that I'm going to keep the highest one. Um, so you can see here it shows that I rolled four dice and three of them I ignored. Um, and then the roll that I used in a game that was, again, the reason I made this, um, involved rolling some number of 10-sided dice and then counting ones that were uh, six or higher as successes and counting ones as failures and then just sort of tallying that up. So you can see here, if you do the math, there are five dice rolls here that were above six. So um, I didn't want to have to type that out every time, because that's kind of a, a, a lot, especially when you're in the middle of playing a game with your friends. So the feature that I, I made this for was the ability to, to save rolls um, and reuse them later. So if I want to um, save a roll, I can make, give it a name. So I'll call this tjug and uh, you know, a variable. 
and then I can use it in an expression. So in this case, I'll do something simple, like I'll roll n six-sided dice. There we go. And if I then go to list my rolls, uh, that's the only one I have saved right now. And then I can easily uh, use that roll later by just calling it with an argument. So let's say 10. Um, so that's it. It's pretty straightforward. There isn't a huge feature set, but as you can probably imagine here, there's a little bit of stuff going on with parsing these expressions, and there is a persistence layer in order to save these dice rolls and then recall them later. So let's get back into slides. All right, um, so how does this bot work? So here's a rough diagram, and um, just as a reference point, we're going to talk about all of these parts, so it's OK if it doesn't get fully absorbed right now. But the main sort of three parts of this bot, so there's um, a library called the Java Discord API library, or JDA, which does pretty much all of the interactions with Discord. Um, it you know, subscribes to events on Discord and then calls into an event listener. You register with it. The, the core of this app is a parser that's built with Antler, and that's uh, responsible for taking the, the commands people type in, especially those dice expressions, and turning them into a command, which is the, the object in the bot that is responsible for actually executing and, and doing something. And then um, because uh, the JDA runs everything by default in the fork join common pool, there's um, a, a sort of optional step here where if there are commands that need to load something from a persistence layer, they can run asynchronously. And I'll, I'll show you how that works later. And all of the data that gets stored is stored just in a single file on the same server as the bot uh, in SQLite. So we're going to dive into those parts. We're going to start with Antler and talk about um, how you could use Antler to build a parser for this kind of dice rolling language if you were going to do this yourself. All right. So like I said, the parser is kind of the core here. Um, and it sits sort of in the middle. It gets called by our event listener when messages come in. And it has to turn those into something that we can actually run. Um, but actually, it's, it's I call it the parser in that diagram, but it's really doing sort of a few different steps, right? So there is a, a step that is just parsing, um, where we're, we're literally taking raw text and we're turning it into an abstract syntax tree. Um, but afterwards, you know, we have to turn that uh, AST into something that is, uh, you know, that we can actually execute. And so for that, we have to write a visitor that can traverse that tree recursively and, and give us something that we can run. Um, so can I get a quick show of hands for people? Has anyone who's used Antler before or has worked with some kind of parser? OK, so a few people. So if you've never used Antler before, I would break it down. There are sort of four steps that you're going to need to do uh, to get it working in a project. Um, so the first step, you're going to have to define a grammar, um, which uh, Antler has a special language for. Um, after you've defined a grammar, you generate a parser. Um, then you use that parser in your code to um, parse you know, raw text into an AST. And finally, you do a visitor. So we're going to walk through those steps um, with a slightly simplified example from this full dice rolling language. Um, and we're going to start off by defining an antler grammar, which really consists of, of two separate sets of rules that we have to define. So um, people who've worked with any kind of parser before are probably familiar with the, the, the fact that there are usually two steps in parsing uh, that are lexing uh, and then parsing. And uh, so we have to, in antler, define our lexer grammar rules first. These are going to describe how we can uh, take uh, the raw text that a user types in, and we can turn it into tokens. Right? Um, tokenizing the text makes writing our parser grammar rules uh, much, much easier, because we can do things like ignoring white space. So once we have defined our lexer rules, we write uh, a grammar uh, or a parser grammar, which uh, is based entirely on the tokens we've previously defined. So we're going we're gonna to look at a concrete example. 
Uh, like I said, we're going to do slightly simplified language just to make the grammars a little more manageable. Um, so we're going to look at a language where we have dice rolling expressions that really fall into two categories. So we'll have simple expressions that are a single term. They might start with the letter D, in which case it shows that we're rolling a single die. Or they might start with another number to indicate we're rolling you know, some number of dice that all have the same side. So those will be our, our smallest terms in our language. And then we will have a complex case where we can take two valid expressions in our language and add them together with the plus sign. Right? So there aren't going to be many rules in this language. Um, so like I said, we're going to start off by defining um, a lexer, which is going to define what are the tokens that are valid in our language. So um, typically, you'll put these rules in their own separate file. So that's kind of what I'm showing you here. Um, the rules in Antler um, look like the, a name and a colon and then a definition. So the, the first rule that we see here, this is pretty common in a lot of Lexer grammars, um, is we're just going to throw the white space away because we don't care about it. You do need a rule that recognizes white space because otherwise white space appearing in your text might cause an error. Um, but we don't actually want to see those tokens when we're uh, writing our grammar rules. So we're sending them to a, a channel where they will be ignored. Um, so then we have rules for basically three types of things. We have numbers. You can see that the, the um, definition is, is using um, you know, a regular expression here. So we just recognize some number of digits consecutively as a number. Um, we have a literal plus symbol. And then we have our, our term here. That is, like I said, uh, a letter D, a number optionally preceded by another number. And on the right-hand side, um, I've shown some bits of text, and the underlines indicate you know, how this would be tokenized. So the, the top part, this, would, this will end up being something that is a valid expression in our language, and it will get you know, turned into five tokens before it gets parsed. But um, importantly, you know, when we're lexing and creating a token stream, this middle line would also be a set of valid tokens, even though the tokens aren't in an order that would end up making a valid statement. Yep. So the number D number, the second number is the number of sides. Yes, yes. This last number is the number of sides, and then. This first number is how many, and if it isn't there, we assume it's one. Um, so after we um, create a lexer, uh, lexer rules, we can make a parser grammar. Um, so the first thing we need to define here is what lexer are we using. So that's uh, up here in the options. And this grammar rule. Um, is going to be very simple. Uh, there's only one rule, and it has two cases. So uh, in Antler, we use this pipe here to separate different cases. Um, I think in Antler, they call them alternatives. So um, this definition is basically saying that a role expression is either this first alternative or the second alternative. So the first one is a recursive case, right? We have, we're saying a role expression is. Um, you know, in one case, it could be two role expressions that are combined with a plus symbol. Um, or in the simpler base case, a role expression is just a single uh, dice term. And on the right-hand side, I've shown um, you know, a, a simple expression and what the AST for that might look like with these rules. Um, so like I said um, earlier, there are sort of two steps. Uh, defining your grammar in Antler gets you sort of the left-hand side of this, uh, this diagram, where you can now parse an AST. So the last part is that we need to come up with an executable model for the language, and then write a visitor that's going to translate our AST into that, that model. So um, this is what, or this is part of what the model will look like in this example. So we'll have uh, an interface for a role command. And all we really want this role command to do in this simple example is we want to be able to execute it with some source of randomness and get back a number. Right? Um, also shown on this slide is our, our command for our base case. So this 
uniform dice command represents rolling some number of dice that have some number of sides. And the execution is, is basically like you'd expect. We generate random numbers um, for each of you know, the dice we have to and add them together. And that's all. Um, and then on this slide, we have our command for our recursive case. And again, like you'd expect, you know, an addition command is really just the same as taking you know, a left and a right side of an expression and executing those and then adding them together. So once we write our visitor, you know, this is you know, visually what, we're, what our visitor is going to be doing. Right? We want to take an AST like this and we want to turn it into this kind of an object graph. And, and they're going to be very similar structurally. It's just that the, the last one has methods on it that we've written that will allow us to actually run it. Um, OK, this one is probably a little hard to read, but it's not too important to get into all the details. The important part to pick out of this visitor implementation is that, again, the structure of the methods you write is going to be very close to the structure of the grammar rules you wrote. Um, so there is a bit of boilerplate here. Um, this extends a class, a command parser base visitor that's generated for us by Antler. Um, it doesn't really do too much, but it does have methods that correspond to the rules in our grammar. So if you had a grammar with you know, 20 rules, there would be methods there that you would be able to override, which is just a nice convenience. Um, so the one method we're overriding corresponds to the one rule in our language. And in, um, in this case, uh, this is the pattern I follow in the Modus Rollins bot is that I, I like to switch on those commands based on um, the alternative. So um, conveniently, Antler actually tells you um, in a statement which alternative in that rule it corresponds to. So that's uh, sort of a nicer way of figuring out which kind of expression you need to parse. So um, the first one is our recursive case. The second one is our base case. And then there are methods that they dispatch to. And again, they, they really do what, hopefully what you would expect. You know, our recursive case is going to recursively parse the, um, or visit the, the sub-expressions and then combine them together. Our base case is going to create a uniform dice expression. And you know, there's a bit of logic here to deal with whether or not there's a number at the start of it. But otherwise, it, it's more or less what you would expect. We're just putting the numbers into this class uh, so that we are representing that uh, die roll correctly. Um, so using it, is, there's a bit of boilerplate, uh, but it's not too bad. Um, but we basically have to start from our, our input, which you know, could be a string, or, or it could be a file even, or, or an input stream. Um, but we need to build up a character stream which we then use to make a lexer, which we may use to make a token stream, eventually a parser. Um, and then finally, we can use that to make an AST. So that gets us to the sort of the first part of the process. Then you can use your visitor to um, visit that AST, and you will get um, you know, an object that you can then execute. And that's really the heart of, of building a parser with Antler. Um, OK, so I went mostly through a really simple example that had you know, one grammar rule um, and only two cases. I, I, I just wanted to give a little bit of a taste of what it looks like when you, you know, build a language that's a little more complex and has more rules. Um, so this is a role expression taken from the Modus Rollins bot. Um, you can see there are a lot more cases. And there are a few other interesting things here. Um, First, you can actually, in Antler, you can use curly braces to add in Java code. So if there's actually some extra um, information you wanted to store or uh, something you wanted to execute as you were parsing or, or you know, building up an AST, uh, you can do those things here. In my case, it's actually there's an Antler bug that um, makes the alternative numbers not work if you use certain kinds of grammar rules. So this is actually an ugly workaround, but it's nice that you can do that. Um, and there are also a bunch of rules uh, that handle things that uh, will be common in a lot of kind of expression languages that look like arithmetic. So there's a rule for brackets. 
and there are rules for division multiplication and addition subtraction. And even though these, these two rules for um, you know, divide times and plus minus are you know, structurally similar, we split them out so that we make uh, order of operations work correctly. So this is a pretty common thing you'll see in anything that looks like arithmetic that has grammar rules. Um, and then we do all still have a base case, except because um, our base case has a lot of those dice modifiers, like I showed you, like keeping the highest die or you know, other things. Um, you know, it has its own rule that describes all of those things. All right. So um, if I were to give tips to someone who was trying to use Antler for the first time, I guess my first tip would be, well, you can write a visitor that goes through your AST and evaluates it all in one shot. Um, I would recommend not doing that. I think it's better to have an intermediate model. It makes it easier to get started, makes it easier to write tests and to implement things in phases. So I, I would recommend trying that approach instead. Um, and um, I think this kind of um, code lends itself really well to unit testing because it's very easy to define the inputs and outputs and makes it very easy to sort of slowly add new cases to your language. Um, so that covers um, Antler in this bot. So now I'm going to talk about uh, JDA a little bit and how you could uh, quickly get a Discord bot up and running. So as a reminder, JDA is the library that, um, at least in the Modus Rollins bot, handles all of the interactions with the Discord API. And um, JDA does a really good job of you know, wrapping Discord, but there are a few things that are good to understand about the Discord API before you get started with a bot. Um, the first is that uh, Discord bots typically will use a WebSocket. Um, they will connect with a WebSocket to the Discord server, and that will be the channel that they both receive and respond to events with. Um, there is also an HTTP API where you can look up extra information if you need. Um, there are, there's a concept of intents in Discord, and this, these are basically a way of telling the Discord API what kind of events am I interested in. Am I interested in private messages, messages on servers, um, people joining and leaving channels. There are a lot of different intents you can subscribe to. Um, and finally, like most kinds of bots, there's a little bit of setup you need to do to get started. You need an API token. You need um, to make an OAuth client. Um, and there's a process for inviting a bot to a server. Um, these things are all really well documented, though, so I won't go through the, the boring details too much. Um, so this example here that I wish, in hindsight, I had made in bigger font is a really simple Discord bot that is going to just subscribe or connect to Discord and then echo messages it receives to the console. Um, so there are a few things here that are worth highlighting. So um, you usually start um, an app that uses JDA with a main method by building a JDA instance. Um, you need an API token and intents, like I mentioned earlier, to, to let Discord know what kind of events you're subscribing to. And then um, you can uh, add an event listener. And this will be the thing that JDA calls when it receives events from Discord. So there is a base class, a uh, listener adapter, that you can um, subscribe, or sorry, that you can extend that uh, you know, has all of the events that you would ever need to use that you are able to override, which again is just a nice convenience because there's a lot of them. In this case, because uh, only, our only intent is message content, uh, we have uh, just the on message received event that we're going to implement. There's a little bit of code here for checking if we're in uh, a channel versus if we're receiving a private message. Um, one thing I find interesting is that the Discord API refers to servers as guilds, which I think goes back to its, um, its lineage as being for gaming primarily. Um, but yeah, and otherwise it's just outputting information that we get in the event, which includes things about what server did it happen in, um, you know, what was the content of the message? Who was the person who sent it? So these are all things that will typically be useful when you're responding to something. Um, okay, so I mentioned earlier that, you know, after we've used our parser 
to generate a command, there's you know, sort of two ways that that can be responded to. It could either, a response could be generated right away if there's no I.O. that needs to happen, or we could um, submit an asynchronous task to another thread that could respond later. So um, I'll show you sort of, this is, you know, um, thanks to completable futures, something that's extremely easy to do. Um, so this is what it looks like in the Modus Rollins bot to handle that. So assuming we have a command that we've generated with our parser that we're, we want to execute, um, in Modus Rollins, that's going to give us back a completable future, um, which might already be finished by the time this method completes, or it might be running in some other thread and, and not finished yet. Um, either way, we can subscribe to it with when complete. And so once that future is finished, the uh, code in this Lambda will run in whatever thread that happened to finish in. Um, so it's a very easy way of sort of dispatching async events. And, um, you know, in this case, we're just replying with the output, whatever the output of the command is. Um, but of course, there are a lot of different things you could do here. Um, so, yeah, tips for using JDA. Honestly, it is an extremely well made and pleasant to use library. Um, but the only gotcha I would warn people about is that it does use the fork join common pool for, um, for spinning off uh, callbacks to your listener. So you just need to be mindful if you're doing blocking calls, uh, and especially if you're running it on, say, a, a free tier machine in a cloud somewhere that only has a single CPU, which was a, a scenario that my bot was in for a while. Um, yeah, and if you do happen to run into problems, uh, unsurprisingly, the Java Discord API library maintainers have a Discord server, and it's very active, uh, and they're all very friendly there. All right, so the last part of this talk is on the, the persistence layer, which is primarily SQLite, and then a, a couple other libraries around that. Um, yeah, so, you know, this uh, persistence layer, you know, is used in this bot just for storing dice rolls and then looking them up later when we want to recall the definitions. Um, and SQLite, I think, is just a really am amazing and perfect fit for this kind of use case. Um, I assume most people here have at least heard of SQLite, um, but if you haven't, it's a SQL database that's backed by a single file. It's extremely lightweight, so you can easily run it in the same VM, even if it's a low-powered, free-tier VM in the cloud somewhere. Um, it has no extra installation process, because you just point your driver at a file and go. Uh, and uh, you know it's a SQL database with ACID guarantees. Um, and it uses SQL, which might not be a benefit for everyone. But personally, I like SQL, so for me, that's good. <clears throat> Um, so I use JDBI for the library to actually send SQL queries and get the results. Um, honestly, you could replace this with anything, whatever your personal favorite thing is. But I happen to like JDBI um, because I, I like writing SQL and controlling what my queries are. And JDBI is basically a nice library for doing that that um, makes it nicer to do than using JDBC directly. So I'm, I'm not going to try and sell you too hard on JDBI, but I do just want to give you a quick idea of what it's like to use it. Um, so a way you can use it, which is my preferred method, is by taking an interface and annotating it with queries describing the, the SQL statements that you want to run. So in this case, I have two simple examples for looking up or um, inserting a new dice roll. And using it, there, I mean, there are a bunch of different ways you can use it if you need to do something more complex. But the simplest way is to just call a method on a JDBI instance that um, will give you an instance of your interface. Uh, and it will handle opening and closing connections for you and all, all of that other stuff. And you just call your method. Yep. I don't know what it stands for, but it is a it's a library that's like a JDBC wrapper. So it, it basically you you can just execute queries as strings uh, like you could in JDBC or make prepared statements. 
but it also has this um, SQL object plugin that lets you do these kinds of interfaces um, and, and just call the methods on them. Yes, you don't have to implement. So you just define this interface and with um, the annotations describing the queries you want to be run. And then JDBI gives you an instance of that interface that will run those queries when you want to. Yeah. Android has room. Pardon? It's room, which is the same thing. You can uh, uh, okay. Um, I haven't tried it yet because I haven't gotten over the hurdle of getting records to work well with Jackson personally. So that was okay. So we, so we we need we need to do some upgrading then. <laughs> Three weekends of my life. <laughs> not following the IntelliJ, I can make that a record for you. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so the last thing, uh, part of the bot for the persistence layer was Liquibase. Um, I'm assuming, like, raise your hand if you've used Liquibase or Flyway before. Okay, yeah, so most people, if you haven't, it's just um, a, a tool for tracking and applying database schema uh, migrations. Um, it's really convenient, and you might think, you know, using a tool like this is maybe a bit much for like a hobby project Discord bot, but uh, my counter to that would be uh, it's extremely easy to set up, and actually it gives you something really nice, which is you don't need a special install script to start up your bot for the first time, because Liquibase will handle the scenario where you just have an empty file that's your SQLite database, so it's really convenient that way. Um, and actually, you know, sure enough, um, when I showed my friends this bot and got them to use it for one of our role-playing sessions, they immediately asked me for a feature. On, I guess not too surprising. Uh, they, they, they loved saving roles, but they wanted to be able to see descriptions for what those roles were because um, they, they gave them short names so they were easy to type, but then forgot what they were. You build your friends. <laughs> uh, in, in beers, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, be, you know, because I was using um, Liquibase, it was really easy to add that feature and not have to re, you know, wipe out my database and resave all those roles. So I think it is, it, it definitely pays for itself even in a small project like this. What is the availability of that bot within that infrastructure? Um, it's just running on a single AWS VM in the scenario. Like it's very lightweight. So if that VM goes down, it's it's toast. How does uh, Discord see that? Um, so Discord sees it, uh, it. Discord thinks your bot is online when you uh, have an open WebSocket. So when the library is is the WebSocket connection is healthy, um, then Discord will keep sending you events and it will show your bot is online in the the UI. Um, but when that goes down, yeah, then, then it thinks your bot is offline and it'll give users errors when they try and send commands to it. Yeah, but good question. Um, anyway, the last part of this um, database setup, this is the single method, not simplified at all, the full code from the, the Modus Rollins bot that does all of the database setup. So putting it all together, it uses JDBI, Install some plugins for SQLite and for that nice um, interface uh, way of you doing queries. Um, uses Liquibase, applies a change log, you know, commits those changes, and and that's it. And then you you have your bot, uh, your database ready to go. Um, so relevant links. If um, you found any of this interesting, or you want to copy any of this to make your own bot. Uh, the Modus Rollins repo is here. It's a public GitHub repo, uh, Apache 2 license, so uh, have at it. Uh, JDA wiki here if you're interested in learning more about how to make a Discord bot with that library. 
And if you're interested in you know, trying out Antler yourself to make your own language, the Antler mega tutorial is like the best free online resource there is for that. Uh, I used it many, many times while I was working on this. I will post the slides to somewhere. Yeah. Probably Slack, I guess. Yeah. We can follow up. We'll, yeah, on Slack for sure. We'll follow up on the meetup in the link to it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Even better. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>